Hi everyone. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm honoured to share some thoughts and track the journey of a fantastic new replica Roman distance sculpture that is now gracing the wall outside of Twicker Healthy Living and Enterprise Centre. This is one of the outcomes of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project, which is delivering a series of these Roman replica distance sculptures from the Antonine Wall um, here in Scotland. But first, I thought it may be quite useful to provide some geographical, chronological and some cultural context into which these unique monuments sit. As the name suggests, these are a collection of sculptures that have been recovered from along the Antonine Wall, and that is the Roman Empire's most northwesterly frontier. Now, this was a massive monument that cleaved a route through the central belt of Scotland right across the Clyde Forth Isthmus. Now along the wall there were 17 ports constructed as we can see here um, and interspersed between those forts were a series of smaller fortlets and watchtowers. So to put the wall into its wider geographical and its strategic importance um, it's highlighted here at the top left of your screen is one segment um, of part of a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site entitled Frontiers of the Roman Empire, which stretches across several countries. Now, the region that we currently know as Scotland saw several incursions from the Roman army, um, dating all the way from the first through to the fourth century CE. Now, the period that we, of course, are particularly interested in is this sort of early to middle second century when the Emperor Antoninus Pius commissioned the construction of this mural barrier around 142. And to give you an idea of how the forts I mentioned a moment ago along the wall um, looked, um, this is Rough Castle. It's in fact uh, in Falkirk and it's pretty much the best preserved fort along the wall. We can see the outline of the fort here. And then there's some annex buildings um, or uh, some annexes over to the side here. So it's a kind of complex, if you like, um, of different features sitting along the wall. You can just about make out on the top there. This aerial shot hopefully provides a wider geographical perspective and setting of Rough Castle Fort, which is just down on the left now here, uh, in its setting with the remains of the Antonine Wall. So what we have effectively is on the south, we have the Roman controlled area. And to the north, we have uh, as the Romans would have called them, wild barbarian northerners um, who had been potentially quite hostile to that incoming um, Roman military force. And then down the centre, we have the Antonine Wall remains. Um, and we'll go over that in a bit more detail in a moment. But after a long period when knowledge of the wall had actually fallen completely out of memory, um, its antiquarian rediscovery prompted the general William Roy to record its surviving features and remains uh, of forts in great detail in his military map of Scotland dating to 1793. And so what this does is it gives us a really fantastic overview of plans of all the surviving fort remains along the wall. And you can see that all of them are actually quite different in character. But they do survive well up until that point, and it's a very useful historic document and resource um, and record, really, of these standing remains in the late 18th century. On the bottom, we even have some really interesting profiles uh, of the wall. That is a sideways view, if you like, of the terrain into which the forts sat. 
But there's long been interest in the Antonine Wall uh, since the in antiquarian times. And in fact, the Glasgow Archaeological Society in particular um, was very prolific in undertaking investigations and um, excavations along it and helping it really to augment our understanding of the wall and the features along it, as well as the installations along it. So maintaining that rough castle fort connection we had a moment ago, here we have members of the Glasgow Historical Society at Rough Castle Fort dating to the 19th century. And the astute amongst you might notice that actually on the left here we have uh, a woman, which is quite an unusual event um, of the day to see women involved in these activities. And we also have a couple of children um, in this photograph as well, which is great to see some young people, even in those days, being interested in their heritage. So the Antonine Wall differs very markedly from its predecessor and neighbour to the south that um, doubtless many of you are very familiar with, Hadrian's Wall. And unlike Hadrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall was not constructed of stone, uh, but in fact it was constructed of large turf slabs that were laid atop of each other. Um, and that stretched to somewhere between three to four metres high, and that's roughly a minimum of 20 turbs deep. And we can just see that in profile here in this section of the wall that's been cut through. And all of these kind of squared off rectangular features that we see, it uh, gives us a really clear uh, and interesting understanding of the stratigraphy of the layers uh, upon which all of these turfs sat and constructed the wall. But actually, we speak a lot about the wall. Um, in fact, the wall was only one feature of an infrastructure of connected elements. Uh, and these elements include the turf rampart, which we see here in Remain, which is the wall itself. Um, and as I mentioned, that stood to a height of between three and four metres. And that was inclusive of a, of a stone base. We'll talk a bit about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, so immediately to the north of that, we have the berm, which is a platform that separated the wall from the deep ditch. It was a deep five metre V-cut ditch, which is often referred to as a, an ankle breaker. And we can see why that is potentially um, the nomenclature for this very Roman characteristic ditch, which is a very, very sharp incline with a ending in a very sharp V at the bottom, as I say, very characteristic of um, Roman ditches. Immediately to the north of that ditch, you'll see the upcast mound, and that was constructed of the spoil from the ditch. But one feature that is very rarely discussed, but should really be considered an equally essential part of that infrastructure, is the military way. And that sits on the south of the wall uh, or in the Roman controlled part of the frontier. A little bit more of that later. Um, but taken together, all of these features really created a sequence of defensive elements against which any incursions from these northern barbarians, as Roman writers would have uh, termed these local, local hostile people, um, so I guess we could say it's a bit like a modern day Ironman um, obstacle course, if you like, that some people actually now do for fun. Um, not me, but uh, I know colleagues um, who actually spend their weekends doing this. And I just wanted to show you how this type of activity really demonstrates what it might have been like um, trying to navigate and um, you know, get over that really muddy feature of a wall um, back in the day, which would not have been a pleasant experience. Um, and you would have had a lot of obstacles to overcome to get to that point. And here, just to give you maybe a better understanding of, of, of the construction phases of, of the wall, we can see the illustration here of the ditch being cut. The legions are you know, discussing the best way to um, undertake their activities. Just to the north of that, at the berm, we can see these 
um, oblong shaped um, holes in the ground there, lilia, which are effectively another set of obstacles. They would have had these really sharp, um, sharpened uh, wooden sticks pointing out of them, probably covered by bracken or other such um, uh, bush type uh, material to hide them. And they would have had, as I say, spikes. Um, embedded into them to, to create a, a very dangerous obstacle for any hostile um, northerners to try to navigate as they reach the wall, which itself may have had similar types of stakes protruding from it. Uh, on the top, we potentially have a walkway, certainly where the forts were located with some bastion up there. Um, and on the right, we can see a reconstruction of a gateway that would have been placed where the openings along the wall uh, would have allowed the movement of people back and forth from the north into the south again. And just to give you even a better idea of how that wall base was constructed, here are the foundations at Bears Den Fort in New Kilpatrick. And as I say, they give us a really interesting understanding um, and context for that very wide, four metre wide stone base that was required for that heavy turf wall to sit atop. We can even see that central ditch, um, a drainage ditch running through that there. And again, that, that drainage ditch coming up on the bottom of the screen, just to give you that overview of, of the, 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 the structure that would have been at the base to hold the, the very heavy rampart on top. So getting back to our main topic of discussion today, the distant sculptures. Here is a map of their fine spots in the vicinity of the wall. Um, and you'll see that many of them have been recovered from the western sector of the wall. And we'll discuss um, where the, the distant sculpture we're talking about today comes from in just a moment. So I thought it would be very useful to give you an idea of some of the distant sculptures um, that we have. And this is the Bridge Nest sculpture. It's perhaps the, well, the best known example of distant sculptures. Um, it's now located in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And it's a really beautifully preserved example of, um, of these unique monuments. And what it does is, it, I think it demonstrates really nicely that a familiar format that we have for them. Here we have a central inscription panel um, is flanked on either side by some really beautifully articulated iconography. Sometimes we also have these pelta on the side, which are shield like shapes that frame on either side these types of central um, inscription panels, which are, as we see here, quite often uh, framed with double ribbed or single ribbed um, frames. But actually, I wanted to draw your attention to the inscriptions themselves, even those of you who are potentially familiar with Latin may not necessarily immediately recognise the text here as Latin. And that's because what we have is a very formulaic, abbreviated format of Latin um, that is very common to Roman inscriptions of the day. And from the Bridge sculpture, we can see the, the pattern of the abbreviated words um, that are common to all of our distance sculptures, um, along with the, the, the English translation. So just to very briefly state the Latin um, abbreviated is Imp says Taito Elio Hedre Antonino Og Pio P P Lige to Og Per and then MP lots of Roman numerals <laughs> and fake. And that translates to for the Emperor Caesar Titus Aelius Hadrianus Antoninus Augustus Pius to give the Emperor his full title. Father of his country, the second Augustan legion built this over a distance of 4,652 units of measure. So these sculptures actually served several purposes. They are dedications to the emperor, showing legionary loyalty primarily. But they also document the legions who were here building the frontier. And that is, as we know, the second, the sixth 
and the 20th. And we know this because we have these inscriptions. They also tell us with that number at the bottom, um, which differs on different um, distance sculptures. So they tell us the length of the frontier that each of these legends were building, hence their nomenclature. But they also, in fact, provide some really graphic scenes of life on the frontier. So we have things like on the, on the right, we can see a religious scene. Um, in actual fact, what we're seeing is the, the legions undertaking um, a sacrificial ceremony. Um, we also have other examples of um, deities, Roman deities, and also some military activities. So on the left, for example, we see quite a familiar scene from Roman frontier sculptures, which is uh, a scene of battle. Here we have a Roman cavalryman who is riding down and in fact decapitating naked northern warriors in the heat of a, of a very vicious battle. Now, another example of this type of sculpture, another distance sculpture, is the Roman, uh, is the Somerson Farm uh, piece on the bottom right here. But actually, we have a similar format. And in fact, you'll notice that on the, on the left of the Somerson Farm, rather than that mid-battle scene on the bridge ness above, we have here now a post-battle scene where we have um, the northern warriors are now no longer in the heat of battle. They are now captives. We can see their arms are bound behind them. They're still naked. Their swords are scattered on the floor around them. Their shields are scattered around them. And the cavalryman is effectively guarding them um, whilst receiving honours from the goddess victory, probably because of the celebration of uh, his victory over over these local warriors. But actually also these distant sculptures served as a form of propaganda insofar as they're demonstrating very visibly and visually the, the might and power and strength of Rome. And, and that's to various audiences, including Roman soldiers, um, communities who were followers of the Romans, um, in, in local vicus, what we call um, sort of small villages attached to some of the ports, um, but also to strike fear into local peoples who would have also engaged with them. So these are really very powerful and iconic objects that are actually unique uh, across all of the frontiers of the, the Roman Empire. Now, it might surprise you to know that none of these objects were found in their original context on the wall. Um, many, in fact, were found in the immediate vicinity south of the Muro barrier, but others, in fact, were built into boundary walls or gateways of nearby stately homes. Um, one even made its way all the way north to Concardenshire, where it was embedded into the Great Hall of Dunalter Castle by the Earl's Marshal. And that is a really enigmatic setting uh, just off the northeast coast of Scotland. But that's a whole other story and we don't have time to cover it today. But conventional wisdom has always been adamant that the distance sculptures record the measurements of the wall, that is the ramparts construction. But you'll remember I mentioned earlier that the infrastructure of the wall um, included the military way. Now, the military way is a critical feature of the frontier um, because it was used to transport troops and supplies along. And I'm quite sure local people may also have used um, this roadway to navigate the area as well. Why wouldn't they? Um, but I'm also going to suggest quite controversially, I would say that um, since only in fact two of the distance sculpture make very explicit mention of the walls construction, in fact, I'm going to suggest the distance sculpture might more logically have been placed along the military way. Uh, a bit like road markers that we're very accustomed to seeing today, in fact. Um, and I think if I can show you this next image, I stole this from a presentation uh, made by Dutch scholars uh, on a completely different topic recently. But I think it really demonstrates my point very nicely. If we can imagine these um, 
Roman soldiers walking along the military way near that border, they are going to encounter, I would su suspect, um, these distance sculptures telling them that the next section of the road that they're walking along was constructed by the 2nd or the 6th or the 20th Legion. So a bit of competition going on there to show you uh, and to show them really what, um, you know, how much of the frontier each of these legions were building. And in fact, some of the distance sculptures uh, were found very closely together uh, and they had the same uh, distance engraved upon them. But actually, I'm going to suggest that what that might suggest to us is that they were placed back to back in the same way that if we are crossing um, maybe the English and Scottish border just now, we will see or even into a city, you know, you'll see you are just entering Scotland or you are just entering Glasgow or you are just leaving. <laughs> so you, depending on your direction of travel, you would know which section of the wall that you um, are walking on and the military way you're walking on uh, was constructed by which legion. So having gone over all of that background, I think we can now return to the replica distance sculpture from Eastern Mains. The Antonine Wall runs through five council areas and part of the rediscovering the Antonine Wall project was to replicate those distance sculptures uh, coming from each of those areas. And the intention was to install them into locations close to their place of discovery. And this particular sculpture was uh, recovered from close to Kirkintilloch Fort and that is number three on our map here. Now here is the Easter Mains distance sculpture. Um, it was discovered in 1740 and purchased by the University of Glasgow to join the rest of its collections in the Hunterian Museum in 1744. Now regrettably its provenance is uncertain insofar as its discovery was recorded only as east of Kirkintilla Fort. We have no more information than that. Stylistically, the sculpture finds real parallels elsewhere in Roman Britain. So, for example, it has a plain central inscription a panel that is flanked by pelter shapes. Now, this is a very similar um, pelter shape that we see on the tombstone of Catia Censorina from Chichester, um, where only the left of that uh, tombstone has been recovered. It also quite closely parallels a dedication to, um, as we see in Latin here, the gods Mars, Rigometis, and the divinities of the emperors. Quintus Neretius Proximus gave this arch at his own expense, uh, and that comes from Lincolnshire. It's also very similar to other distant sculptures from the Antonine Wall itself, um, and that, as we can see here, on these griffin like beautifully articulated um, pelta from Okandabi. Uh, another one that's in the collections of Glasgow Museums from East Millican. We can see less decorative uh, styles there, but still we can see the terminal ends there um, that are uh, the beaks of griffins. And finally, it has real parallels with um, another one from Castle Hill. Right, another very highly decorated piece there with this love heart detail in the centre there, finished off with rosettes in the centre and at the end terminals. So these pelta were actually, they were shapes that were very popular decorations uh, on material culture from frontier forts and from settlements. So they're very militarised often in their character uh, and in the context we discover them from. Um, most of these date to from the 1st to the 3rd century and they derive, as I say, predominantly from these military contexts. And Pelta is actually named after a light crescent shaped shield which was in use by the ancient Greek infantry. Um, and the imagery that has been commonly used um, is for belt decorations, brooches or pendants, for example. But actually in classical art, female Amazonian warriors are often depicted, depicted with the shield. Uh, and that's why another terminology that's applied to them quite commonly is Amazon shields. And we can see that shield there and also that pelta-like shape in the 
acts of that fallen Amazonian woman at the, the bottom there. So the resemblance to other Antonine wall distance sculptures is evident. Um, this inscription again in abbreviated Latin translates to read for the Emperor Caesar, Titus, Aelius, Hadrianus, Antoninus, Augustus, Pius, again to give the Emperor his full title, father of his country, a detachment of the sixth the victorious loyal and faithful legion built this over a distance orb. So there is a dichotomy present on this particular distance sculpture. Um, what that dichotomy is, is this is an incomplete inscription, a distance sculpture, if you like, a devoid of any inscribed distance. What might that suggest? Well, either it's a waster, in other words, a, a piece that has been wrongly carved, there's been an error with and it's been cast aside, which is what has been traditionally determined by and believed by and propagated by antiquarian writers. Or is it merely an incomplete object, an incomplete inscription that awaits the carving of an appropriate distance? Um, what might that suggest? Well, that suggests potentially that the wall and its associated infrastructure must have been built before the stones were commissioned in order for these correct distances to be inscribed upon them. And that might explain why some of the measurements appear squashed into the available space on some of our Antonine wall um, sculptures. I think it probably helps to give some context to these sculptures and how this particular one was um, brought to life. Um, and it's probably helpful to look at that in a stage process. So stage one was to commission the artists uh, to produce the sculpture. Um, Scottish based, uh, Scottish borders based sculptors Josephine Crossland and Luke Batchelor that we see here were commissioned to produce this particular sculpture um, by April 2020. Um, this is just a shot of us at the Hunterian Museum where the sculpture is now embedded into their centrepiece exhibit. Um, and we're really just discussing the sculpture and the other sculptures from the Antony Wall to give a bit of context um, to the piece. In the second stage, this sculpture was carved from Wittenfell Quarry in North Yorkshire. Now that's a really fine to medium grain blown sandstone that is widely used uh, across Scotland and Northern England for its responsiveness and its durability and also because of its excellent carving quality, which allows for a really sharp aris. It's very similar in character to the sandstone used for the original Roman distance sculptures which was most likely more locally sourced, possibly even from a quarry in Bishop Briggs, which in fact was used until very recently, um, as late as the 19th century. Um, but this stone has actually been used uh, extensively across Scotland anyway, and it's an excellent raw material for carving because of that fine grain with a unique colouring uh, to it. Uh, and as I say, it, it provides a really sharp, crisp edge that weathers well and it articulates the lettering and iconography really quite beautifully. And so the next stage in this process was to draw out all of these features that were to be uh, carved into the sculpture. And that provided a scale so that they could be uh, accurately uh, placed onto the stone. Now, the original inscriptions were sometimes quite poorly spaced and uh, cramped at line ends, as I mentioned a moment ago. And that's a situation that the artists are emulating by employing quite typical Roman techniques. Um, and some of the hand tools that were used for the sculpture, which although was inevitably much slower than, for example, a machine cut digital version, um, these hand sculpting techniques allowed for um, hand and eye coordination and that helped to discover natural forms in a more organic and natural way and, and in order to produce an effect that was much more aligned to these Roman originals. But actually attempts not to overwork the piece left some quite crude tool, tool marks and that actually proved quite challenging to the artist since modern day aesthetics tend to require a more precise and refined finish. So it's 
applying against the natural instincts of um, skilled artisans to ask them not to refine their surface too much in order to emulate these Roman techniques and make it more aligned to the originals. Um, but these sculptors also employed some hand carving tools that were really remaining largely unchanged from those that were used by uh, Roman artisans as well. And here is the finished product, a um, beautifully craft, uh, crafted piece, um, proudly displayed by the artists themselves and uh, you can see at the bottom their apprentice stonemason. I don't know what his name is. <laughs> So the sculpture has now been installed um, into a wall outside Twecker Healthy Living and Enterprise Centre uh, and that was actually undertaken on the 16th of December, so just before the end of the year 2020, um, along with some information panels. I think we can all agree this really is a spectacular piece of art and it's a wonderful and accessible piece that's sitting in a location that is again very easily accessible to local communities who are encouraged to engage critically with their new sculpture and start to think about creating their own connections with it through stories that have yet to be told. And a lot of these will deviate very significantly from the original narratives that were imposed on the Roman pieces and that continue to be imposed through traditional uh, museum displays, for example. And that's just another image of it in the wider context of its location. It's really quite beautifully done um, and the surrounding stonework is uh, really very... But critically, this sculpture, like all of the others that are part of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project, it's not burdened by the restrictions that are necessarily in place in the museum setting. And they include things like lighting, access times, no touching policies, guided content and interpretations, uh, or even internet access that's required to engage with some of the associated digital content these days. But things also like lighting over the course of a day or during different seasons will also transform the way that we experience these sculptures and the stone's pattern even will change inevitably over time. Uh, and that is, you know, its surface, um, its surface feel and texture and, and view. So people are encouraged to have a really tactile, emotional and fully immersive experience and forge new relationships with their sculpture and I hope in the future that I might be able to meet some of you as you engage with this and hopefully some of the other uh, replica sculptures. Um, I'm hoping in the future to undertake some research on their contemporary performance for example and their reception in the present day. So next time you're wandering around your stately home or indeed any stately home or church, uh, old farm buildings or an old wall, a boundary wall, you know, I'd ask you to look very carefully and check that there isn't a Roman distance sculpture embedded into it. Uh, if there is, please do give me a call. I would like to uh, see more of that. <laughs> um, but actually another more serious final point that I would like you to consider when you're contemplating these things now and in the future is, is to consider how they might have looked had they been um, Im imbued with colour as the originals have, um, as I've been able to discover through my own research. Here we have um, that iconic scene from the Bridge Nest sculpture digitally reproduced to show how that piece would have looked had it been um, you know, adorned with its original pigments. We see some beautiful reds and yellows that were coming out in the, in the palette of colours applied to it. And in fact, we can even see the different shades of red that are applied to, for example, the uh, cavalryman's cloak, his tergies, uh, that is a leather strapped tunic overlying his uh, original tunic here. Um, so different colours of red even in his uh, helmet and a bright lead red um, that depicts blood um, on the end of his spear coming from presumably one of the fallen warriors that he has um, pierced with his spear. And that red lead, that blood red is something that the Romans were often using to depict blood and we can see that really graphically 
um, highlighting the detached head and um, the top of the neck of this decapitated northern warrior here. So I think that colour brings a whole other dimension and dynamic to the piece and brings it to life in a way so that we can really now imagine this really brutal scene of battle in a way that that stark light brown or blonde sandstone um, doesn't permit us to uh, see in many ways. So I hope you feel encouraged to travel to Twitter and experience the sculpture firsthand. And you can do that by following the directions in this really helpful leaflet that has been produced by the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project team. Um, and that provides you with um, an overview of the, of the sculpture and a map with a, a location spot telling you exactly where it's located, as well as some information on how you can travel to see the piece from uh, different directions and using different forms of transportation. So thank you again for enjoying me today, um, joining me today even, I hope you did enjoy it. Um, please do feel free to ask questions or offer any comments. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to have a chat about them. <laughs>